this morning as I speak your word. Amen. I do apologize beforehand, I may take most to everyone's degree a touch longer because I want to finish Colossians. I'm going to try not to, but I want to finish the Colossians mini series this week. So if you think about the last since January the 1st or the one the Sunday after Christmas, we've been unpacking Colossians chapter 3 and Colossians chapter 4, and we've been in Colossians chapter 4 these couple of verses, I think now, for about four weeks. And I'd like to explain to you why um, we've been doing or going through Colossians chapter 3 and 4. And it is the fact that if we are honest with ourselves, we know that we're broken people. We know that when we look in our spiritual mirror that we are broken. Every single one of us has experienced hurt and experienced pain, experienced rejection, and the broken. We all have hopes and we all have fears that are absolutely unfulfilled and sometimes in our lives, in our family lives, they're all marked by tension, they're all marked by bitterness. I hope instead of giving the place where the peace lives, it's the place, place where pain lives. Emotionally and spiritually we feel empty, we feel unloved, we feel unattractive and we feel ineffective and with all of that in our lives we also know that our relationship with Jesus isn't what it's supposed to be and believe it or not what we've been doing in Colossians chapter 3 and 4 is a way of trying to encourage you my intention is to help us to reassess our lives and our commitment to Jesus and to encourage us into 2022. Uh, sometimes we get so caught up in our lives that we actually forget what God has done for us. Sometimes we get so beaten down by what's happening that we forget how much God has changed our character. Sometimes we're so hurt that we can't see God at work definitely at work in our lives, protecting and limiting the extent of the pain. Sometimes we become so self-centered because of that that we forget what God has brought us out of and where we are now. Sometimes we forget that God never promised to get us out of the mess that is our lives. Rather, He promises that He will be with us through the mess that is our lives. And one thing that I want to take out of Colossians chapter 3 at the beginning of chapter 4 is this. I want you to be absolutely certain that God is with us as a group and that God is with us as an individual. We need to know, we need to remember, we need to go over in our heads the promises that God has for His children. You remember in Hebrews chapter 13 it says this, Keep your life free from money, for the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he's, He has said, God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So that we can be confident and we can say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? How about Deuteronomy, the one that we all pull out all the time. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread. Dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you.
think about it like this. The God, God the Father simply calls us to repent. And to accept what Jesus did on the cross and receive Him in faith. So I'm not talking about our salvation. I'm talking about our lives. What happens on a day-to-day -day basis. So often we just sit in our chair. We just sit and wait. We sit hurting. We sit being hurt. Or we sit watching other people be hurt. Or hurting. We're expecting a miracle in our lives or the lives of the people we're praying for. And we fail to understand that in actual fact we might be that. The way that we interact with them, we might be the person that they actually need. See, sometimes we as Christians forget that we're actually called to service. We're commanded to do something. And often we're so ineffective in the world because we forget that command, or we fail in that command. So we're commanded to do something at exactly the same time Remember that in His service we have peace. Remember Jesus in Matthew says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest. There it is again for your souls. For my yoke of service is easy, and my burden, or the burden of service, is light. So instead of sitting, I've got to ask the question, what's our job? What is this duty? What is this obligation that we as Christians have in our families, with our spouses, with our children, in our workplaces and in the community? And it's not that hard. <coughs> Pardon me. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15 says this. Put on there. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, get this compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So also you must forgive. And above all this, get this, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. That's the service, that's the duty that we're called to. And it's, it is to be a mental state, it's to be an emotional state, it's to be the spiritual state that we are in all the time. But get this, it's something that we have to actively pursue. As Christians, I can understand if you're emotionally moribund and sitting in one particular place, just imagine being at the table and there's flies on the food. Oh my goodness, there's flies on the food. Well, until you actually lift your hand and do something about it, there's going to be flies on your food. We actually have to actively pursue this. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you. That's something that you do. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Some of us probably shouldn't be singing. But psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart. That's something that you do as well. Be thankful. Choose to be thankful. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means we don't do whatever we want. We do what He would want us to do. And we are to have peace in that. All the time giving thanks to God the Father through Him, Jesus. So one of the things I want us to think about this year, whether it be in a marriage, whether it be in your family, whether it be with your friends or at work, wherever we do everything, let's do it as an extension of our love for God. That just makes our love for everybody else a little bit stronger, a little bit deeper, a little bit more long-suffering, a little bit 
more, a little bit more self-sacrifice. If you remember Colossians 3, 18 to 4, 1, it's talking about being a constant witness in all the different relationships that we have. It's not us just saying, oh, I am a Christian. Rather, it is constantly living like it. So that even our enemies will say, he may be an outsider, but he is a Christian, and I can see it being coming out in his life. So that within the family, our husbands, our wives, parents, children, grandparents, and work, on holidays everywhere. It's so letting our character be that which attracts people to Jesus. And then our words back that up. And I am totally aware that I fail. And I'm totally aware that most of us fail fairly often. So now that's the introduction when we come to Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Read this passage before. And I'm not sure what you think when you read this passage. Maybe you think it's a command to pray, which it is. Maybe you think it's a command to be wise, which it is. Maybe it's a command to be careful in what you say, which it is. Maybe it's good advice from the Apostle Paul, which it is. Actually, it's more of a command. And to me, it's all of those. But I actually find this one of the most engrossing passages in all of Colossians. I find this a blessing not because of what's written, well, sort of, but by knowing what isn't written, what we don't see in this particular passage. See, the thing that we forget all the time is the life of Paul. And this is where it applies to us. Actually, when you think of all of the disciples, you think about this. Andrew, Peter, James, and John were fishermen. They were not at the top of the social ladder, and yet they were called to be his disciples. Matthew was... Now, I'd like to say that from a Jewish perspective, Matthew was a tax collector. He was hated. Simon was a zealot, which means that he was a revolutionary, basically. He was into politics, he was a bit of an anarchist, and he wanted to overthrow and kick out the Roman government. And Judas was a thief. That's all pretty bad. Now we come to the author of this particular book, that's Paul. See, we forget what Paul is. We think of Paul as Paul the Apostle. We don't think about where he came from, or perhaps we look well. This was written about Paul the Apostle. It says he was bald-headed, bow-legged, short man with a big nose. He had an unbroken eyebrow that lay across his forehead like a dead caterpillar. That comes from this paraphrase of some old Greek. The actual um, translation is, a man of middling size and his hair was scanty and his legs were a little crooked. And his knees were far apart, he had large eyes, and his eyebrows met, and his nose was somewhat off. See, we never think about a character of a person. We think of the apostle. Let's think about what um, other people said about Paul that we do know of in the scriptures. It says this in 2 Corinthians. His letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech of no account. He was, for all intents and purposes, he was walking along the street with someone that you would ignore. And the thing that we forget often is the old Paul, when his name was Saul. Remember in Acts chapter 7? I'm going to read all of it, but some of the parts are highlighted, and it says, And he said, This is Stephen, the first martyr, Behold, I see the heavens opening, and the Son of Man, or Christ, standing at the right hand of God. But they, people around him cried out with a loud voice, put their fingers in their ears and rushed at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, killed him. And the witnesses, 
people that were watching laid their, their, laid their garments down at the feet of the young man named Saul. Saul was in on it. Saul wanted to get rid of these Christians. And as they were stoning Stephen, he, Stephen called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice. And this is Stephen, he says, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. And then he died. Verse 1 of chapter 8 says that Saul approved of his execution. He hated Christians. Goes on a bit further. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation of pride over him. And it goes on that Saul, Paul, was ravaging the church and entered house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. That's what makes this passage so exciting. The contrast. Acts chapter 9 says this, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked him for letters to the synagogues and Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way which sort of Christianity was called that, and men or women might bring them down to that was Paul. And then God broke in. Come and read Acts chapter 9 if you want. Acts chapter 9 verses 20 says this. And immediately, that's he, Paul, changed. He proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. We understand so little of the hardships. We forget so little of where he came from. But these are the things that happened to Paul because he chose Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is part of an autobiography. It says, Five times I've been, I've been, sorry, five times I have received in the hands of the Jews before he was whipped five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked a night and a day. I was adrift at the sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger in the sea, danger over false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is a daily pressure on me. My anxiety, my worry for all the churches. Think about the contrast with Colossians chapter 4 where Paul came from and what he went through and we often forget when we read this that he has just been arrested this is his last mission trip he's taken back to Rome against his will and it's either 66 out or 68 AD and this time not like last time, this time he's not staying in a luxury hotel this time He's in Rome and he's in a jail cell. And yet here he is, without worry, without anxiety. From Philippians 3 it says, he says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own for one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what he writes in his prison cell on death row. 2 Timothy 2 he says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, for the believers, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He goes on, this is a trustworthy saying, saying for we have died with Christ, we also live with Christ. If we endure, we also reign with Christ. If we deny Christ, He will deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. For God cannot deny Himself. Paul knows exactly what's coming. As 
a matter of fact, within about eight to 18 months of him writing those particular words in Colossians chapter 4, he's executed. And Paul knew from the moment that he accepted Jesus that his world was going to be turned upside down. This man chose God. This man who is used as the messenger of the gospel to those that aren't used to us. He gets to talk to high priests, he gets to talk to kings, he gets to talk to emperors, he gets to talk to jailers, he gets to talk to people. In Acts chapter 9 it says, The Lord said to him, Paul, go, for he is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Sometimes we sit and sometimes we hurt. Sometimes we're worried. Sometimes we're bitter. bitter sometimes we're broken. But we forget that God actually showed Paul beforehand what he was going to have to suffer. And he still chose God. And this is the man. This is the man who writes in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. The man that's in the prison cell, the man that knows he's going to be executed very shortly, he says, continue steadfastly in prayer. And he doesn't say to get me out of here. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Be watchful. So pay attention. Pay attention in your prayer with thanksgiving. At the same time, also pray for us. And it's not about getting out of prison. It's that God may open to us a door for the word, for the message, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I might make it clear. And I would say to us, in our lives, in our homes, we are the witness. The way that we live is the witness that makes it clear. But also at the same time that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. He goes on verse 5, walking wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with salt. And I first, in the workplace setting. Gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. That doesn't mean we have to go out and proselytize and be nasty and hard and brisk and in your face all the time. Though there sometimes is a place for that. But this is when people look at you, see your witness, that you are prepared and open to say, yes, I follow Jesus. And these are the consequences. And be wise in what you say. You don't have the same spiel for everybody. You pray the Holy Spirit will God let you touch them in the place that they need to be. So why do I find this encouraging? So you might think that you're too insignificant. You might think that you are too unimportant. You might think that you're too damaged to be his child or to be somebody that God uses in somebody else's life. You might think that you're too much of a failure. You might think that God wants to have nothing to do with you. You might think that your circumstances are way too far gone for God to be able to work with you. You may think that your circumstances are too far gone for God or God to work through you. To work through your circumstances. But see, the thing is this. If you think of the life of Paul, what happened to him, God allows you God sometimes actually wants you to be in the situation that you're in. As terrible as that may sound. Because God wants you to show the people around you that His grace and His love reach into whatever mess you're in. Witness is 
with your life. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. God is with us. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Jesus our Lord. So this year, in whatever situation you're in, however your relationships are turning up, for good or for bad at home, God will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Sometimes we don't call it. We sit and we stew. Remember, Romans chapter 10 says this, for everyone who calls, who pleads, who cries on the name of the Lord will be saved. But here's the bit that we need to take in this year as a church. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? Well, let me tell you, we're sent. Our job is to be witnesses. That may be the preaching that we have to do this year. To live our lives in a way that brings glory to God. That is supposed to be encouraging. <clears throat> and I hope it is. I'm going to pray and then I'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, thank you for your presence, thank you for your love, thank you for your, the grace that you show us. Father, I pray that we'll go out of this church this summer, that we will live our lives in, the, in a way that witnesses to your power, to your love. 